Welcome to the Toolhound Learning Center, a set of resources to help you get started using Toolhound 5. Okay, tips and tricks. This is our last official section module for this afternoon before our wrap up. Um, this is going to be kind of free and loose. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of tips and tricks using Toolhound. You don't have to follow along. This isn't going to be a hands-on lecture kind of thingy. It's the only one. I'm just going to quickly run through a bunch of things. Some of these things we've already seen over the last couple of days, so I might be going over things a second time because some people poached my content. Not that I'm bitter, but it's okay. Um, some of these things are handy, some of these things will be of no use to you, but uh, they are interesting and it might give me an opportunity to throw more stuff your way. So, let's have a look. The different things we're going to look at in this tips and tricks section include using the parts catalog, being more productive with grids, um, streamlining recurring jobs, so anybody is using requisitions, and they're not expecting the people in the field to fill out those requisitions for them, this might be handy. Quickly adding several of the same item. Increasing visibility for auto returns that we s didn't discuss explicitly, but we have covered. Uh, also tracking off-site repairs. Setting up the email and the different spaces that you can use that as well. and. I've got a couple of tips and tricks that were provided by end users which have made it into the, the corporate newsletter. And uh, I'm going to give you a couple of tips about things that are coming up in the next update. So this is a sneak peek of what you're going to get in the next update before the update notice goes out, before it's even finalized, ready to go. And we're just going to run over the resources that exist already for you. Okay, so last night at dinner we were talking about ladybugs and bees and wasps. Wendell? <laughs> <laughs> Every user conference has an inside joke. Ladybugs are the inside joke for this one. Okay, so the parts catalog, it's all over the place in Toolhound. Uh, it's the shopping cart style way of looking stuff up. So it's used for requisitions and requests, transaction re uh, recs, purchase recs, transfer requests, okay? You can filter on the left-hand side to narrow down the sort of things that you're looking for. So either by partial description or partial part number or by the category and subcategory. Remember I mentioned this the other day when we were talking about requisitions? Okay. And these filters are either or, you can't combine them. And then on the right hand side, you've got the results of what you're searching for. These are your actual shopping cart options. So if you've entered, if you've entered pictures attached to your part numbers, you can include the images here. And somebody, somebody was talking about that before. So this makes it much easier. Do I need the two-inch hose? Do I need the three-inch hose? Which one goes with which air compressor? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, just in case, with my, <laughs> with my test data, I have to keep myself entertained. So I have bees and I have ladybugs in the insect category. And the ladybugs are consumable, not because you eat them, it's because they fly away and they don't come back. The bees come back to the hive, so they're bulk, okay? Just a little insight into my quirky personality. So when you're looking at the grid, you type in the quantity and press tab to move off the field. And if you actually want to go look at the part number itself, you can click the blue hyperlink to go look. And it'll pull open the part number page and you'll see all the details there. Anything that you have selected when you're using the catalog will have a check mark. So that's the parts catalog. I think everybody's pretty... Where do we find the parts catalog? As I said, that's for all the requisitions. Transaction requisitions, purchase requisitions, and transfer requests. So 
So it's under the create, when you go over to create and you fill in the general information and then you go to the catalog tab. That's where you find it. We're good? Okay, grids. I've mentioned this in passing a couple of times. There are several tools that you can use to optimize your use of grids. All changes to grids are temporary. They're not what we call in the biz persistent. They don't stay. So if you reorder columns or change the sort order to columns, it's only while you have that page open. If you refresh it or you close it or reopen the page, it's reset to the default layout. So you can click on any column header to sort by that column header, much easier than using a SQL statement and then sort ascending, order by ascending, descending. You can, for any filter row, remember that's the little funnel icon that you have at the top row, you can type in a value and it will filter what appears in the grid based on that value. Something else you can do for pick list, drop down list, is it has some grids will have an Excel type auto filter. So if you click on it, it will have all the possible values or everything or blanks or non-blanks. And you can select from that list and use that to filter as well. As I mentioned, you can drag and drop columns to reorder them. So you would just click on the column header, drag, and uh, you would position it in its new space. The other thing you can do if it's too cluttered or if what you're seeing is too much information, it's distracting from you actually parsing the information that you've got in front of you, is you can drag a column right off the grid display. And again, that's temporary. It'll come back the next time you come back. So you click the column header and just kind of flick it off through the top. Everybody's good with working with grids? Now here's the fun stuff. Remember yesterday in the basics we were looking at doing requisitions, transaction requisitions, okay, and it was the Quentin, Quentin Formaggio and he was requesting his stuff and then we went to the catalog and we selected everything. Okay, how many people here have the same sort of job or shutdown that happens regularly? Hands up. Altex? Shell? Anybody else? Oh, Leona, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I suspect SMFI will have that situation as well. Okay, so if, uh, especially if you have project managers who are planning out or your foreman who are planning out these jobs ahead of time, what they can do if they can't be bothered, you don't have sufficient users or you want to maintain more control, you can just feed them a list of parts from Toolhound, part number description, in an Excel spreadsheet, and give them a third column, quantity. And they'll tell you how many they want of each part number. Then you can delete the description column, save that file as an SN S CSV, and you can actually import that right into the requisition. So if you look at the left-hand side here, you'll see what the spreadsheet will look like. Two columns, part no, quantity. Really easy. It gets saved as a CSV. And then when you're creating your requisition, you fill the information out on the general tab. When you come over to the details tab, you simply click on the upload arrow and specify that file name. And it sucks everything in there and all you have to do is review it and save it. And it generates your requisition for you. So no using the catalog, no entering part numbers. This is a mini import. You always have to upload it. Yeah. You can absolutely save that template, but you're going to save it in Excel. It's not something that's available in Toolhound. Yeah, and it's it's two columns. Part <laughs> really, <laughs> it's it's part no p a r t n o and quantity q a n q u a n t 
I T Y. Yeah, it's been a long two days. Um, so that's all you need. What you could do is, let's say, for example, take your inventory master, spit it out to Excel, delete all the extra columns, send the remaining spra spreadsheet off to your project manager or your superintendent or your foreman. He does what he wants and sends it back to you. You import it. You delete the description column and import it. You can then save that spreadsheet for the next job. Turbine, turbine shutdown, right? Plant maintenance, all that stuff, annual maintenance, and just reuse it over and over and over and over again. Any questions about using that requisition import? No? Okay. Next up, adding multiple items. Yeah, Gary pinched this one off me, but that's okay because it's really useful. Um, when you want to add multiples of the same thing, to do it quickly, we're all busy people. If you're not using the scanner, look up the part number. This is for serialized items. Look up the part number, go to the items tab, click add items, pops open the serialized items page, type in the primary ID, your stocking point. Status is what? When you're creating a new serialized item, what's your status? In stock. In stock. That was Catherine. Heads up, Catherine. I'm getting better at this. Haven't killed anybody for two conferences. Um, and then once you've saved it, you just hit the repeat button. And all the information, the common information stays on the screen. All you have to do is change the primary ID and the serial number because that will change. Keep going, and hit save, repeat, save, repeat, save, repeat, save, repeat until you're done. That's the quick way to add a bunch of serialized items through the browser. Yes, Lynn. Okay. So add an ID and add item. Same thing. Okay, here's the thing. Item ID, item ID identifies something uniquely, right? Now we were talking yesterday about alternate IDs. So if you have a primary ID and an alternate ID, they're both item IDs, but one's the primary, the most important, and all the others are secondary. That's the same thing. So you could have a barcode as a primary ID, as well maybe a serial number or an etched number as a, an alternate ID, but they're both item IDs because they ID or identify an item, a, a, a unique piece of inventory, a tool or, or a piece of equipment. So, so a, a scan could be either the primary ID or an item. Sorry, run that by me again? A scan, so a barcode. Yep. Well, item I, uh, primary or alternate. Yeah, absolutely. If you want, if you have etched numbers and you want to see that, because the primary one is the one that appears on all the reports. So regardless of what you scan, that's the one that's going to appear on the thing. So if you want to keep your etched number as your primary ID, you can absolutely do that. Remember, um, we were talking at break how a license plate is like a barcode for a vehicle, right? And everybody gets that concept, a license plate, barcode, same thing. Um, you have the serial number for the tool, the VIN for the vehicle. If you back into a pole, if you back into a pole, you go out and you get another license plate. The number is going to be different. You just slap it on the car. <laughs> same with a barcode on a tool. If the barcode gets damaged, you just slap another barcode on it, okay? So if the serial number or the etch number or the VIN was an alternate ID for that vehicle, you can look it up by that and what will pop up is your barcode. You can do that opposite. You can have the barcode as the secondary or alternate ID and your VIN as the primary ID. Six of one, half a dozen of another. But most frequently, people would put the barcode as the, as the primary. Yeah. Uh, multiple.
multiplied in us. Auto returns. Does anybody remember early yesterday morning? It was so long ago. When we were looking at the location settings and we were talking about highlighting auto returns. So items that were, uh, let's say, Robin took out a backhoe because she's doing some gardening <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> Robin has a backhoe and Tamara brings it back. So we want to know that there is a change in the possession of that before it coming back. So we can highlight that by setting a transaction type return auto and the tr return status of OK auto. So we talked about it, but this screenshot down here shows you what actually happens. So uh, hope happenstance took out this particular item, whatever it was, and then it came back and was put away on the shelf, but somebody forgot to return it in Toolhound. And then somebody else came along, Grant Simpson came along and took that same item, how much longer? That was three days later. So when Grant took that item, it did the return auto under Hope's name and continued on with the issue. So that's that second option, allow reissue and auto return of serialized items. Er, no, that's sorry, that's the return of... Yeah, it's one of them. So now it really pops out. You can see exactly what happened because it's not a standard transaction. Okay. Off-site repairs. This is the most frequently used tweak of Toolhound that we have going. Um, to increase the visibility of items going off-site for repair, because when you do the maintenance module, I don't remember if you mentioned that yesterday or not, Gary, that when you do a work order for something, whether you're doing it in-house or you're sending it out to some third party, the status of the item doesn't change in Toolhound. It still stays as in stock. There's nothing, okay? So to increase the visibility of inventory going off-site for repair, we're going to do two separate things. We're going to create an employer that's called off-site repair, and then we're going to create every third-party repair house or repair shop that we're sending it out to as a personnel record. The reason we're doing it this way, why don't we just send our why don't we just create non-stocking locations as our, our third-party vendors? Because, because you might want to report on everything that's out for repair at one time. That way you can filter for the employer off-site repair. Otherwise, you're going to, if you use a non-stocking point, you're going to have to say, is it this one, or this one, or this one, or this one? And then you're getting into those complex compound criteria that you're going to need to either create manually each time or save them. And you're going to have a whole bunch of lines. Um, and every time you add a new third party repair, you're going to have to create a new, s update your criteria. Really not an effective use of your time and it's, uh, a lot of maintenance going forward, and if you forget, it becomes a mess. So if you create an employer as an uh, off-site repair for and then each vendor as a personnel record, you have the opportunity to then pull a report for the issues just for one third-party vendor or for everything that's out for repair. Okay, so the second part of this little customization tweak is to create those transaction types that we were looking at yesterday morning, out for repair and return from repair. So if you can see this teeny weeny little screenshot here, we have something that was returned by Hope Happenstance and then we sent it out for repair instead of a plain old issue. We've got out for repair to HWJ Calibrations. HWJ Calibrations is a personnel record 
under the off-site repair employer. And that went out uh, April 7th, and it came back, returned from repair from HWJ Calibrations, and then the same day I turned around and I issued it out to Tory Fleming. Okay, then anything that's currently out for repair, again, it's very small, but if I filter for the employer name offsite repair, I get everything that's issued out to Acklitz and to Buzz Electrical, all on one report. Everybody's really quiet. Does that mean the wheels are turning or does that mean that I lost you? Well, yeah, the dates, yes. Well, how's Toolhound supposed to know? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean a wrong date? Whenever you do a transaction, it just automatically pops up today's date and most of us are not in a time warp. We tend to, the vast majority of the time, we're doing stuff right now. Right. We're living in the moment. <laughs> right? <laughs> mm-hmm. No. Uh, Dean, dates are depending on your Windows, what, no, hmm, hard-coded? believe so. <laughs> regional, yeah, regional. Um, date, a uh, date, could you please make a Jake? <laughs> On a note. <laughs> yeah, but thi this one, I mean, whenever I bring this up in trainings, everybody, oh yeah, like this. If stuff is going off-site, it really separates it out from the regular issue return. Or um, even if it's not going off-site for a repair, if you've got a third party that's doing all your calibrations, like either if you're not doing your torque wrenches in-house or you're doing load testing on your chain falls, any of that stuff, use the same system. Okay. But Gord, you're doing all your own torque wrenches, right? You gave it up? Oh, well, never had. Oh, okay. But you're doing something in house. No? Okay. So use this. Okay. Email setup. We've mentioned this and mentioned this and mentioned this and mentioned this. Email setup. Now, Toolhound comes with the ability to email, send emails, some semi-automatically, others depending on what you want to do. But if you're on cloud, the background stuff is already done for you. Don't worry about it. The only thing you have to worry about is setting up email addresses on personnel records and your user records, okay? If you're not on cloud, you need to make friends with your IT personnel. If you haven't already brought them cookies, brownies, or muffins, all IT personnel like those items, unless they're gluten intolerant, then bring them Skittles. Um, so what you have to do is configure in the background your SMTP information. Um, there's a document on the website that explains how to do that. And it does require a valid email address to send from. It won't receive any information, but it has to be an email address that is set up in your own internal system that will do the sending. And it will send in two directions. It will send to us certain things, and it will send to your own people certain things. So the things it will send to us or submit a bug, Request suggest a feature, and then to your people, notifications, and it will email the tools out from the personnel transaction history, which, which I mentioned in passing. Okay? Uh, so submit a bug, suggest a feature. It's under 
I know Jody knows this one. He can do it in his sleep. So it's under help. Submit a bug. Okay, and as long as you've had it configured, you don't have to jump out to your email system to send us, i.e. support at toolhound.com, an email about a problem you're having. You just fill in your name, your email address, company. We already know what version you're running. And then you just put in a description of whatever the bug may be. And then down at the bottom, click Submit. If you do not submit an email address, it will uh, enter an email address, it will not allow you to send because how are we supposed to get back to you? Suggest a feature improvement works exactly the same way. Okay, and that comes to everyone in the support department. The other two that I mentioned are the notifications. Gary went over notifications pretty intensively yesterday morning. But I'm just going to come back and have a quick look under personnel. Now let's go looking for Oh, Quentin. I like to pick on Quentin, 858. And if I look at the transaction history tab, he has one item out. We know it's out because it's highlighted in yellow. If the SMTP information has been configured and if we have an email address, I'm going to hide the ribbon, email address down here for Quentin and I click that button, it will send an email to Quentin saying, hey, you've got these tools, which is kind of cool. If it's issued out to a job, it's not listed here, but it will be included in the email. Okay? Any questions about emailing, what you can email, what you can't email, any restrictions? Jody. The question was, if you're using the uh, tools out from the personnel transaction history tab, can you CC it to the supervisor? No, it's automatic. You've it, no. It, there is no CC available. Um, it just goes straight to that one individual. Yeah. Nope. No, that's just it. This is Toolhound. It's coming from that email. It's not coming from your mailbox. It doesn't have anything to do with your mailbox. It comes from whatever that email address was that was configured in the uh, configuration file for Toolhound. Which confuses the heck out of us, Jody. Maybe it could be finning Toolhound support. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, CC the sender. But then the sender is going to be whoever is logged in. I, if it's just you. But if we've got 37 people sharing a login, who, what address are we going to use? So uh, that, that's a maybe. Jake, CC user, okay. Any other questions about the email setup? What would you, what, well, here's a, here's a question. What would you like to see it do? No, we're gonna let that one percolate a bit. I don't know, anything's possible if you throw enough money at it, Catherine. <laughs> Uh, maybe.
So you would want a configurable list of email addresses to send, to be copied on a send of a tools out. So the notifications. Yeah. Well, you can do that now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For notifications, rem remember Gary showed you that you have the users that you can add. And also in that email, um, there's an email field. Mm -hmm. And you can put in multiple email addresses separated by something or other, comma, semicolon, comma. Okay? Down in this field down here. Right, right. User provided tips and tricks. These are giving credit where credit is due. We've had a couple of users come up with some kind of cool stuff that eventually made it into the newsletter. Some of them did. The notifications that we were just talking about, because Catherine kind of segued from the tools out email letter to notifications and can we send multiple? <coughs> Instead of sending that by email, you could send a text message. Now, of course, your SMTP server still has to be set up. Your notifications have to be configured. But the difference here is that you would instead of having the email address be the actual email address of the individual that you're sending to, you would put their phone number in there in the format supported by their cell carrier. So you know that you can email, send an email to a phone, phone number at whoever dot whatever. Uh, so here's a list, and this page again is in your proceedings, your, your content slide presentations, uh, www.nopage.net slash smtp.htm. So it was Will Freezy, Freezy Freezy from Daniel O'Connell Sons. He's the inside joke story from the last user conference. He's quite the dancer. And uh, he, he brought that up. He actually started doing that. So the other this one is like the heavens open and the angels sang when I got this email. There is a Chrome extension that will allow you to run Silverlight. This is amazing. Everybody has been really upset that Chrome is no longer supporting Silverlight. This is your workaround. It's called IE Tab, and you can look for it in the Chrome extension store. And once you add the extension, you go to Options, configure your Toolhound website and you can run it in Chrome. Life is wonderful. And that was Amy Curtis from Jacobs Global. Yes, please send her a text message, Lynn. Does she, know she's <laughs> she doesn't know she's famous? <laughs> she's the one that sent me the email. And as I said, like the heavens open, the angels sang. I've been very sad about the whole Chrome situation. Lots of people have. Okay, things to look out for in the next update, which are really pretty cool. There is, just like Brown, FedEx, you can now capture signatures on the scanner for stuff that's already been issued out or any sort of transaction receipt. So whether it's an issue or a return, if you have the transaction number on the scanner, you can actually go and get a signature. So let's say you issue out of the your main tool crib or your warehouse, and you're issuing it out, but it gets on a truck. And maybe you have a driver that goes out to site, and he's got his little scanner in batch mode, his Dolphin 9090X, and he gets to the site. You've already done the issue. You've printed it off and sent it with the driver as a packing slip. You get to the job. He takes his 9090X out. He says, here's your stuff. Sign, it's transaction number 1742, sign here. Guy signs, driver comes back. The other part of this is you can now print those signatures on the transaction receipt, effective with the next update. This is something that we've wanted to do 
for years and we're finally doing it and Robin is is she's looking excited in the back but I think she's more excited about how excited I am about this <laughs> Printing of the signatures. I don't know how many people have asked for the printing of the signatures. Gary, how many people have asked you to print signatures on the transaction receipt? None? <laughs> people only ask me for this, this, this sort of stuff. Okay, so I, I've had, I don't know, easily 20, 30 requests for this over the last several years. So that's very cool. The other one that I found very cool, Gary mentioned it before, we brought out in the last update in 0816, the inventory barcodes support Avery 5160. Now the personnel barcodes support Avery 5160 as well. So all the barcodes, job cost codes, except job cost codes, now support the Avery 5160 label format. Yes. Um, the other biggie, is reassign assets now has filters for job, subjob, and cost code filters. Robin is going from ear to ear on this one. Yes, when you're reassigning from one job to the next job, uh, from one individual to the other individual, you can filter what that individual has out, by or entity has out, by the job and subjob. Currently, if you use reassign assets, even if you select a job and subjob, it's still going to list everything that's there, regardless of what job and subjob you uh, you've, you've specified. So now it's actually going to filter by it. Watch your update notice for a full description of how this works. If you are new, if I don't have your email address, if you don't remember having gotten a, an update notice in the past, Ping me, email me, so that I can make sure I add you to the update notice distribution list, okay? And watch for the next update notice. Any questions about those four things? It's, it's like the small things that get me really excited. Um, August 16th. Okay, but yeah, you probably need to update. So th speaking of versions, to know what version you're running, you'll find it in a couple of different p places. You're going to find it on your login page down at the bottom. You can see that this one is 1103, 2016, 1103. That's November 3rd, 2016, right? Because that's a build date. Your version is a build date. The other place you can find it is on your status bar under the ribbon. And the status bar gives you the name of the user that's logged in, your organization name, all that stuff. But you've also got your build number there, your version there. The third place you can find it is under help. Finally a reason that somebody's going to look at the help menu and then go under about and if you scroll 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 down to the bottom second to last line is going to give you your version number here's a pop quiz for anybody who's been with toolhound for a little while what's the first thing you do after an update has been applied if something's hinky Nope. <laughs> Clear your cache. And what's the gotcha with clearing your cache, Wendell? Make sure preserve favorites is not checked because otherwise it's just an exercise in futility. Yeah, and th I say that in the update notice and people don't re read that part even though it's in red. Um, so different support resources, S if you want to use that submit a bug, suggest a feature improvement, make sure that your SMTP information serv email server is configured so that you can send email. We have the online help, we saw where to find that under help. 
It's right there. Or the other place that you can find help is any, any page within Toolhound on the toolbar over here where we've got the at plus 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 green means go. Yeah, you have a question mark there that will open up the help page for that topic. And look at that. We've got all that information available to you. Okay. The other place you can get help under help, user guide. User guide basically pulls together all those help pages into a pretty table of contents that's more navigable. Okay, or easier to move around in. Purchasing, how do I receive inventory? How do I add vendors? Okay, that's the help. We also have resources available on our website, <coughs> www.toolhound.com slash support slash resources. We also have um, the videos are available on YouTube on the Toolhound Learning Channel. They're also available under support resources under videos. Uh, the same ones, it just depends on your organization, what's blocked, what's not. If you do go directly to YouTube, you will have the benefit of being able to see the videos full screen. Now, here's where I ask you, what are your secrets for using Toolhound to its fullest? What tips and tricks do you have that you can share with everybody else? Make yourself famous, live in infamy. Anybody? Mark? Nothing off the top of your head? No? Jody? Can't think of anything? Okay. <laughs> Leono, yeah, what could, what? The phone number? No, just cell. Oh, there's only one. Okay, just cell. Okay, but if you had multiple cell phones, you could put the phone number as the alternate ID. Yeah. yeah. So you're taking advantage of the alternate ID. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh, fuel cards, that's a biggie. Yeah. What system are you, how do you implement that? Because I know a lot of people, that's an issue for them. Right. 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 Yep. Okay. Right. Okay, so the part number is the card plus the expiry year. Okay, when that card expires, you make sure they're all returned and you make all the serialized items, which is the actual cards inactive, and then you make the part number inactive as well. Great. Right, and it's not all the same month either. Right. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Mm hmm. Anybody else? Jackie? No? <laughs> Sorry? Brain is sore. <laughs> Wendell. You have to have some sort of special tip or trick for Toolhound. You have to. You've seen it from both sides now. No? Okay. <laughs> Control Alex. 
Control L, what's Control L? Control L, really, Control L. Well, there you go, I learned something. Control L is search instead of clicking the magnifying glass, the look up. Con oh yeah, with silver light, Control C, Control V. Yeah, that is your friend, because there is no right click copy, right click paste. Jody, you thought something up? Right. That's a good one. That's a good one. So the issue is, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. And uh, even in your case, because of the zero story, because of the older version, yeah, so when you're doing the inventory adjustments, remember I said cost, 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 whenever possible you want to have the costs. Um, so Jody's suggestion from one of his users was to do the inventory adjustment, but for one less than what you actually have on hand. And then when the person, whoever has the cost information, gets that information, they do that inventory adjustment for one with the cost, and that updates the other one because zero dollar values are ignored when doing calculations for average costs. That's a good one. So who's using the non-stock inventory type? Is anybody going to start using the non-stock inventory type? Jody? All it does is to, yeah, right. Do you have a better understanding now of its use? Yeah. Right. VMI, you could do that. Absolutely. Vendor managed inventory. Yeah, the Acklands people, they come in and they have their own barcodes on your shelves and it includes the min-max. Yeah, they come in and they automatically restock for you. That's definitely one way to use the non-stock because th the, the idea beside non-stock is that you're only keeping track of things going out. You never have a quantity on hand. You never have to do inventory adjustments. It's not serialized inventory. So it can be either stuff that you're never going to count or virtual items like we used for the rental. We have a part number for that. Um, or if you have bags of rags or things like that, loose bolts, any of that sort of thing that you're never ever going to count the quantities that you have on the shelf, but you want to make sure, uh, keep track of them going out. And Gary, I believe you had another suggestion for non-stock. Right. Yeah. So to reiterate what Gary said, yes to the VMI, absolutely, because you have an idea of what's going out. Even though the vendor is taking care of what's coming in, you still have the usage reports, et cetera, for what's going out and what gets used. Okay. Does anybody have any other special processes? Leona, <laughs> that's really special. But does anybody else have anything that's any special process that you're using right now? No? Anybody have anything else they want to contribute? No? Sure? Going once? Going twice? Gone. Okay. So uh, that's it for the tips and tricks. As you can see, there are lots of things that you can do to tweak Toolhound. Um, the variants of the different inventory types, etc. 
that presentation is in your proceedings conference materials. Um, I think that now I'm going to ask Mr. Perry, Dean Perry, to come up here. And this will be the end of my session. What did I forget? Bolt kit. Bolt kits. Ask Dean about bolt kits. I guess I'm going to tell you about bulk kits. Does anyone know what a bulk kit is? Jody, anyone have heard of it before? Not at all? Does anyone put together packs of PPE or bulk and consumable items for 50 people for a shutdown or something? Have you? How do you do that right now? How do you get it into Tool Hound? <laughs> okay. Well, we've got a solution. And it's a, another one of these unadvertised features. It is probably documented somewhere. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what it is. So, has everyone heard of serialized kits? I know you have, yeah. Well, this is a kit that you can put together. It doesn't take as much maintenance work as a serialized kit because you don't have to really work too hard at keeping them. And they dissolve as soon as you issue them out. So for example, if we have a PPE kit that has a hard hat, some gloves, some glasses, whatever, you've got 50 men coming on the site and you gotta issue all these out. The easy way to do that, instead of scanning the seven different items to each person, is you create these bulk kits. And it's as simple as creating a part number. So we'll just call it a bulk kit. Or whatever. PPE kit. We're going to specify that it's a kit. And we're going to make it bulk. You can only make two types of kits, bulk and serialized. And we're going to give it an ID, and we'll just call it a bulk kit, just to keep it simple. And we'll make it visible everywhere. Okay, we'll save that. And you'll notice that there is a kit contents tab created up here. So we're going to tell it what's in this kit. And we just add the part numbers. And I don't know the part numbers that are in here, so we'll just grab some things. Um, bulk. It's a part catalog that has nothing in it. OK, so we'll do some uh, simple things. We'll take a hammer and a screwdriver. This isn't PPE, but this is what we have, and a chipping hammer. So we've added three of these items in the kit. And we can say, well, they need two hammers. So we'll change that to two. So all these items could be bulk? Bulk or consumable. You can't add any serialized items. And if we look back at that list, there probably wasn't any serialized items on that list. And we save it. So now we've defined the kit. To build these actual kits, we physically go out and we build seven of them. And to tell Toolhound that we have seven of them, we do a simple inventory adjustment. So we go to Adjust Inventory. We hit the plus plus, yay, hey, whatever that is. <laughs> I haven't been indoctrinated yet. And we put in bulk kit. And we're going to build seven of them. I did something wrong here. When we issue the kits, it's the contents of the kit that get issued with their associated cost. So this kit doesn't really exist. It's a virtual. You don't need a cost here. That's right. 
And then we hit save. Oh, I don't have enough ball peen hammers. Good job. Okay, so let me do another inventory adjustment. Uh, what is that? Ball peen 16. Plus, plus, da, 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 da. I was expecting Cheryl to do this. So. What was it? Eight? I never used tool hound, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Cheryl? Yes, sir. There we go. Nope. Okay. H A M. Thank you. <coughs> it was twenty four, right? Okay, we'll put ten in stock. And new. Probably not enough, something else in there, of course. <laughs> I'll do something even better. I will take it out of the kit. <laughs> I knew that too. Okay, so we're assuming that there's none of these in there either, which kind of defeats the purpose of the kit, but for our example. I just deleted the kit is what I did. Okay, so now you're going to have to uh, just take my word for it, I think. Okay, I'll explain it instead of show it to you. So we're going to do the inventory adjustment for the seven items. It'll put seven of those kits on hand and remove the contents that are in those seven kits and allocate them to in kit on the location tab. So it'll show that there are seven times however many are in that kit in the kit and not on your hand anymore, quantity on hand. When you go to issue that kit, it will issue the contents of the kit and then the kit will disappear. So then what you've really done is just issued those seven items that are in those seven kits. So it's something that we haven't really advertised too much, but if you have bulk kits that are going out, especially for a shutdown or something with large volumes, use the bulk kit feature. So when we issue, the part number's still there, but we take out that quantity on hand. So if we issued three kits, we wouldn't have three of those kits on hand anymore. And the issue, if you look at the transaction for the person, would show the seven items that are in the kit are issued to the person, but not the kit itself, just those seven items. So it's as if it was as if you had issued those seven items individually. It's an imaginary box, yeah. So if you had a job where a person stayed in either both books slash the full work for the month and fewer items in there, just to issue the full items of the book. In that case, you might just, just 
you could do that or you could just use the serialized kit because the serialized kit can also have bulk and serialized items in it as or consumable items as well. This, yeah, that's the other way of doing it too. Can you create that serialized kit without serialized items attached to it by saying it's a serialized kit part number? Or do you both name the actual serialized item and say it's that one and it's not that one? No. In that case, you would just hand them that thing and scan it yeah. instead of building the kit. That does not work on a transfer. That does not work on a transfer. Okay, so I thought I'd throw that in there. I'm sorry I couldn't demonstrate. I'm, you know, like Bill Gates, everything blows up when you do a, a <laughs> demo. Uh, we probably could. Make a note. Make a note. <laughs> kits on transfer, bulk kits. <laughs> if you purchase that kit? No, it doesn't exist in the purchasing world. It's a virtual thing. I can't make a note of that, no. But, but things that you put in the kit, you have to have it on hand first. Yeah. And then you make the kit and take the copy of it on hand. Correct. Okay, so when the kit goes out, none of the stuff that's in the kit is required to come back? No, it does. It What it does is it issues that stuff out as if you had scanned each one individually. So it's outstanding still and is expected to come back. If it's a bulk item, if it's consumable, no. Yeah, it takes it out of the quantity in hand and says it's in a kit. And yeah, when you do the inventory adjustment. So if you say you're building 10, then it builds those 10 kits, takes them out of hand into the kit. <laughs> yeah. When you buy them from the vendor that way. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. make each item separate, yeah. Some things to think about, being able to purchase a bulk kit. I have my doubts, but we'll look at it and see what we can do. So, the, so a serialized kit could be, if we buy a big load of goods, got two baggies and a car bomb, those could be four different items in the kit. Yes. So serialized item can have serialized items. They are a lot of work to maintain because each kit is its own serialized item and you have to maintain it separately. Whereas with the bulk kits, it's just a number of them, a number of kits that have the same contents. Okay. <laughs> Only your imagination. Okay, so that is bulk kits. If you have any more questions, Cheryl will be glad to answer your questions. Thanks for watching this video from the Toolhound Learning Center.